Hello, uh, one more time to uh, a nice chat uh, recorded for the B3, the biennial of the moving image. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen of whatever gender you prefer. Uh, my name is Johannes Grenzfurtner. I'm currently uh, based in Vienna, Austria. I'm an uh, artist and filmmaker. I've been doing a lot of crazy projects in the last 30 years, uh, made movies, buried people alive, uh, you name it, but we're not going to talk about any of that today because we are talking about something really, really important. Financing. How do you finance creative content? Uh, get inspired. And uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm like the target audience, uh, although I should be moderating and hosting this because I'm very much interested. How can you get your creative uh, projects uh, funded? Uh, and it's wonderful to be in a direct uh, time travel here to London, who is, uh, uh, London is like a, an, hour, an hour back uh, of, of Vienna. So uh, I, I hope you enjoy the past. I'm already in the future, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's good to have you on, on the show. Uh, brief introduction. Uh, we have two wonderful guests. We have Hetain Patel, uh, who is uh, an artist uh, based in the UK. And we have Rihanna Zaman. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And you are a director. Uh, so it would be great. Maybe we'll, we'll start with you, Rihanna. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, uh, what you're doing, what, what's your background, and uh, uh, maybe like a brief uh, glimpse already into your perspective on financing creative content. Yeah, I'm just going to switch on my lamp, actually, because suddenly it's got very dark in, this, uh, in the past. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I guess I, I'm a, I sort of refer to consider myself an artist, really. That's kind mm -hmm. of my background and my training. Um, so I didn't go through sort of the conventional uh, industry orientated um, education. I kind of came through a creative arts, much more independent focused filmmaking practice. Mm -hmm. um, experimental film, I guess, is what I do. Um, playing with different forms um, and styles of fiction making and non-fiction making and blending them together. Um, yeah, I guess what what I do, what's my uh, perspective on on finance is that it's like incredibly hard. So you, at times you're working on a shoestring, oh, yeah. on a zero budget. I but, feel you, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the austerity is real. Um, but then at other times you have yeah, you, I, I'm also aware that you can get quite, um, be quite lucky and uh, get some incredible support behind you where people believe in what you're doing and um, should get you access to funds. So normally I work within um, working with public funds, really, and that's kind of the, the route that I've found myself in. Um, so, so, yeah, working with institutions, museums and galleries um, and, and yeah, but very much believe in a, in also like DIY, um, methods and processes. And so I'm interested in alternative structures to more institutional models as well. So yeah, that's my take so far. Hopefully we can unpack that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> um, hi, 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 um, yeah, I mean, my, my background's uh from a visual arts uh training as well i get it like likewise rather than film as such and uh uh film and video is um a, a part of my practice i also do kind of sculpture and performance and uh, uh a, a bunch of other stuff and I, I guess film is probably the primary medium that i use uh digital i'm, I'm not kind of um don't have i've not been doing the skill stuff with actual film i'd like to let's like try that i guess that's uh, a problem of financing most of the time yeah i know it's so incredibly expensive um and so you know i guess maybe rihanna and i from the, the, the from the same place in the sense of in terms of financing uh, i think i don't know if it's um a uk artist thing but the because there's because there are public funding streams around here i guess things like arts council england and 
uh, and other funding pots that that tends to be the way that artists try and uh, fund their creative projects if you like uh, and so mine's been very much in that stream uh, it, through uh, public funding and working with institutions um, and then and then again kind of but but it all and but in terms of um, raising f funding I guess um, it, it, again it's like what what it, I guess it's partly about thinking about what the film needs um, and you know there's there's bigger and smaller scale things and um, you know I feel like I might apply to to different pots or have to work in different timelines depending on what the project is um, and yeah so I, I guess I guess what I don't really have experience in is working uh, I guess commercially in film in the sense of um, I don't know people working with studios or places that might give you cash but then want input on what you're doing uh, I think the places that I tend to get uh, look for funding to get funding is that you know you, you get art full artistic control uh, over over what you're doing even if the funding is um, sometimes a bit of a pain to get um, I'll, I'll I'll stop talking there I realize we're going to talk more about this <laughs> it's totally fine no but it's it's very comparable in Austria so we have a pretty good uh, public funding system for arts video art all kinds of art uh, at the same time uh, it's almost like a blessing and a curse at the same time uh, because because in, in my career of making art sometimes I had this like these like strange moments when I thought of like okay so what kind of project can I could I come up with that would actually guarantee better funding for what I'm doing? Because I kind of learned like the bureaucratic ways and how to fill out the forms and all that stuff. And also kind of like already knowing what kind of stuff the jury actually might like better. So I kind of had this like almost like a censorship in my head. <laughs> uh, what, what kind of things I didn't even apply to for art grants because I thought they will never fund that anyway. So do you experience stuff like that yourself? Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I've ever done it that, that way. Maybe mm -hmm. like if, if I've got a project I want to do, I've definitely tried to write about it differently mm -hmm. or um, angle it in a way that I think the funder might, be more amenable to or that I might have experience knowing that the kind of thing that they might be looking for so I, w I wouldn't say I've necessarily changed my project or or, or or whether or that it's had any influence on what I want to try or, or make but more about the the challenge feels to be what the languaging is sometimes of, of how you apply to or have a conversation uh, with a funder um, so and that how that's the translated that's, into kind of like the language of, of the of the institution, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah. I think, I think there's also a bit of a difference in the UK around how the various funding streams work. So we have Arts Council England, which is quite general funding for the visual arts, where as a filmmaker, you could potentially apply. But then you have film funding and um, the more experimental strand of that you would go to uh, the majority of government grants public funding goes to quite a small organization called film london and so actually it's streamed quite it's it's actually there are, there are very few pots actually i think probably you get better funding in europe <laughs> than in the uk like arts funding in the uk is pretty terrible so a lot of a lot of artists here and particularly filmmakers tend to um subsidize their practice by taking on other work so a lot of a lot of teaching um, so the art school system here is obviously a little bit different as well. So in terms of the the ways in which you might shape and package your projects according to a funder, I think it's whether you're trying to move out of the, the sort of the specific arts bracket. And so there are these sort of areas where you can pitch or you might actually work with a producer or work with more industry professionals in order to build a kind of a you know you make a short before you apply for funding for a bigger film um but really it's about um i guess networking within with industry professionals in order to then access the money in a way so it's it's actually like you're building the scope of the project um in order to move into quite a different sphere of working 
I don't um, know if that actually is maybe what you've already stated, but I guess, yeah, there's, there's the, the shifting of what the project is, but also it's a kind of a, it's a different beast in a way. I think like many artists um, don't actually want to work on that scale. And actually what you can do and what you want to do and the means, you know, you can, you can do it through the public funds available, but you know, they are quite few and far between as well. I, th I think that's a really good point as well about um, a, pr a producer as well. Um, and that I feel like that's the same, whether it's film or any kind of arts, really. Like I, I think it's, there's a lot to be said for um, getting assistance or paying for someone's help who can do the stuff that you can't do. And I think that definitely goes for funding. Um, and I, I definitely find that useful in terms of working with a producer sometimes to, um, you know, help to try to access funding pots that I don't have experience in, or I don't know how to make that application successful, or to speak the lingo. Um, I, you know, I don't have experience in getting money from things like BFI, the British Film Institute, or the Film Four Pots, or those kind of more filmy, filmy sort of things. I've never done that on my own and and so I, if I was going to do that I, I, I probably would um, think about trying to work with a uh, find, you know get some assistance from a producer who who might be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah in Austria there is this term it's called culture manager so cultural manager uh, and oh. uh, there are a lot of uh, people like that around who kind of like as you say like know the lingo help you like with what projects you might be better off uh, applying at what grant institution and, and stuff like that. Still, sometimes I have the feeling that there are that there are like gaps. For example, it's pretty easy to get something like in the range of like five or ten thousand euros in Austria for a small video arts piece, and then there is almost nothing until the Austrian Film Institute uh, starts jumping in, and it's like at a half a million euros or something like that. Mm. Like in really big films, like all the like the M Michael Haneke films and all that stuff, they are all funded by the Austrian Film Institute, and there's almost nothing in between. So, like, what would classically be indie film funding, in that case, does not exist. And uh, and I'm being I'm being uh, arguing and quarreling about it for years and years. But of course, it's also a matter of like uh, how much money there is for arts and how much money there is for for film, film and video art, yeah. I think that's but, very similar here, actually. Yeah, I think there's a there's a big gulf for that mid range. So there there are many pots for sort of the twenty or thirty thousand mark, um, unless obviously the major vast majority is probably less than that between like mm -hmm. around five and ten. But um, but then yeah, to kind of bridge it to a kind of a feature length piece of work that would require a crew and or a studio or something like that, I think it's very very difficult. Um, so it's, it's quite under, under mapped in a way that there's not really an acknowledgement that there are many artists working in that sort of trying to work in that middle ground. Mm. So what happens actually is you quite often here, uh, you get a lot of partnerships between institutions mm. in order to generate more funding. So works will be touring. So you might be originally commissioned by one gallery or institution or museum, and then they will build a partnership across various places. In order to generate the kind of the, the the budget for what that project might be, and then the work will tour. Um, mm. But then again, that's also super niche. You know, that, that's not you know that that's very few artists get get that kind of like exposure and that kind of backing. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, and even then, it's, uh, it takes a long time. Uh, you know, it's like because each of those partners have a relatively small pot that they can contribute to the to the main project if you want to do anything in that gulf area of you know 20 to 100 grand or something like that you you really end up working with a lot of partners which takes a really long time to to put together and then that on top of um sort of timelines for exhibitions rather than screenings uh, tend to be quite long so combining that across all different partners and try and do funding and then put in match funding applications on top of that i think it ends up being you know two three years you know before well for me at least before i can get a project uh from from idea to to in in the gallery if you like and and most of that time for me is is raised is trying to raise money uh and um meeting with partners and 
putting in funding applications and going to interviews and uh, and all that sort of thing and then and then along that way um the the project develops artistically as well um but in order to kind of i think um w- one thing that i've found useful for me is if i'm working on what feels like a big project that's going to take two three years to to fund and to show i do also apply for some of those smaller pots along the way to try to do some r d um that helps me explore some of the ideas i think it's really important that we we do what we that what we can within our own means uh what you know rather than just thinking right i want to do this big thing and i'm gonna have to wait this amount of time and get this amount of money well, actually, there's, we've got we've got lots of things that we can do along the way, sort of thing. So you know, shoot some stuff on your phone with some friends, or 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 whatever, or get a smaller pot and do you know a few days of research and and try some things. And and I personally find that that um, um, sort of keeps me going uh, a little bit. And and sometimes I can develop things in those smaller strands that can help take a bit of budget strain off the bigger bit that we're kind of uh, w- working towards. Mm-hmm. Uh, so are, are you like uh, Rihanna? Are you working like in 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 a, in a similar way, almost like uh, like uh, t- trying to like uh, using stepping stones, so to speak, to 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 get to higher budgets or to to make your projects possible? I don't know if I'm like um, looking for higher budgets necessarily. I think it's generally like driven by what the work is and what the, the demands of the work is. So actually, for me, I think what often happens is there's like um, a period of like a period of uh, an initial period of fundraising, and then that will generate a sort of a research period, which will then lead to more fundraising, which will lead to the next stage, which will lead to the next stage. And then kind of the, the kind of um, the scope of the project becomes clear from that. Um, whether you know it's going to lead towards a, a, a much bigger piece but I certainly I think I don't think my my works have have required like a, a huge mm-hmm. I, I don't you know a million pound budget yet or mm-hmm. even like hundred thousand pounds or anything like that I think I'm working on a much more lighter through a lighter process so I shoot a lot myself I edit up my work myself um I also, you know, I'm very active in the research and the development. So if there's a, if I'm working in a documentary mode, which is what quite a lot of my work has been for the last few years, um, I'll undertake a lot of the research process myself, like in this conversations and interviews and workshops, um, and, and tend to manage quite a lot of that independently as well. So it's much more of a, a sort of a, a one of a better word, um, you know, uh, shooting. I can't, I'm terrible. I always mix up metaphors, so I'm not going to try and say it because I'll really embarrass myself. But sort of like a, a bit more on the hoof, like shooting on the hoof. I hope I haven't made a meal, meal of that uh, saying. But um, but I guess I'm also, I think there's a lot of, I think I think a lot about how money is spent at the moment and where money is being spent. And so I think I'm actually a little bit... I don't know what I what I feel about um, hundreds of thousands of pounds being spent on a on a film just yet. For me, I, I haven't felt like I've had a project which warranted that um, in terms of scope and scale. I mean, I have there are things I'd like to do that involve travel, and so maybe that becomes a thing where things need to scale be scaled differently. But at the moment, I'm also thinking about like economies and the economies that we're engaging in and where money is spent and attributed. And I think you know there are lots of things within film which kind of reproduce these quite um, hierarchical or quite exploitative ways of working. So whenever I work, I try and employ a flat fee structure. So there's no distinction between like a director or a DOP compared to a runner. Everybody's on the same rate. So trying to instill much more cooperative um, models, actually, that don't just import wholesale uh, industry models, but try and offer different ways of working. I guess I am also interested in kind of, uh, yeah, like being very hands-on in that way and and what that can generate. So I do work with a DP sometimes, actually, DOP sometimes, and I do sometimes work with sound recorders, but um, when I have scaled up, it's often, um, yeah, it's it just sort of feels like, um, how do you not let the project run a, the that run away with it the production can run away with the with the work sometimes and you're kind of trying to 
negotiate that balance between retaining the integrity of the work without it becoming all about the um, the production. Mm -hmm. If you know, I mean, uh, not to make a false distinction between those two things, because I think they're connected, but you can very quickly get caught up in um, a, a way of doing things without really asking yourself, like, what does it mean to engage in that way of doing things? And how does that impact what the work's about? Particularly if you're dealing with social or political issues, you know, that are trying to touch upon issues of class or, um, you know, um, social inequality or something. And so it's how do these how do all these decisions then impact what the work is about as well? In my, I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to build a bit more like congruence between the methods and what the work is trying to address. Mm. Um, mm. No, I, yeah. I can, I can totally see that because the main problem with, with bigger uh, film productions is that as you see the very moment it's about more money suddenly like, uh, there's more there are more needs and there are more like hierarchies popping up and it's uh, suddenly suddenly a strange uh, feeling emerges that that is probably like a bad impact on on, on your project and I, I i can totally see that absolutely i mean i i made my last feature film for twenty thousand uh, euros in, in that room behind me because there was no way getting funding for it and uh, and i also felt like the more people uh, are trying to convince me that it can't be done or that it shouldn't be done or that it's weird, the more I had the feeling of like, I should just like do it, what, whatever I can. <laughs> and then I ended up doing it. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ketain, uh, is there uh, like, the, does that resonate with you? Like the yeah, yeah. Also being financially kind of like in a way independent also from, from external forces? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of what uh, Rihanna says, you know, it's kind of, I think you need to be really conscious about what kind of film you're making, films you're making, but also if you're talking about financing and budgets, that, you know, it's very easy to think that as you progress in a career, you should be just, you should be working with bigger budgets or that sort of thing. It doesn't, it doesn't really work like that. It's kind of, I think you need to be conscious about what you want to make and how and why and and I, f I feel like if you do want to go for you know big million dollar budgets whatever fine but like what's the reason for that you know it's kind of it shouldn't just be an, an, an auto an auto treadmill treadmill kind of thing um and I also think that's one of the things that being an artist affords us to do a little bit um you know speaking to some friends of mine who work in a, in, a, in a different way um on TV and, and st with stuff like that, that, you know, the, the, the pressures that they get or the sort of input that they have to take in uh, artistically, financially, and um, sort of really dodgy ways that um, that team operates feels really horrible. Like, um, you know, I think I take for granted a little bit that I get to choose and negotiate and work with people in a different way to, to someone, you know, um, I don't know, a big budget, budget provider telling you how something's got to be done um, and, you know, um, compromising you in what you want to, what you want to do and make. Um, so, so, I mean, I, but, but at the same time, you know, I guess I'm sort of expressing my own fears as well uh, in, in the sense that I, I do know that the kind of stuff that I want to make pr is probably going to take more money. Um, than I can currently access in in the current funding streams that I that I know how to, and so I guess I have a, a fear of what happens when that you know how will I deal in, if if I'm able to try that how will I deal with that of of being um, pressured to do things that you know that I'm not that, that I'm not used to working in that way or um, it's a funny thing isn't it uh, you sort of know a bit about how you work but you don't really know about the next sideways upwards or downwards ways that you want to move into somehow yeah we don't i guess there's there's something really that really chimes that you don't want to be making work in the same way over and over again you want to see you want growth or um you want to see feel those shifts in your practice as well where you have the freedom to try something new and you you know you don't want to just be um like restricted or hemmed in in that way because mm. you know this is what is known and this is how much you know 
you can just afford in this way. So it's trying to explore what, how you can push those parameters as well, which mm. are for sure, like financial, obvious, or often. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, what what I what what for me was always very important is that the very moment uh, you kind of level up in a certain way to to get bigger budgets or you have access to better galleries or something like that you're always kind of like moving into new power structures and for me it was always important to understand them so when what what happens with me and my project if i put myself into a completely different context and whenever you have a bigger budget or something like that that context like somehow shifts Right. Actually, I, I felt that. I'm not sure if that uh, if it's clear what I mean with that. But but I was always kind of very uh, uh, afraid, as as you say, uh, head time uh, of of what would happen <laughs> with with me and the project uh, if if that context kind of shifts or grows in a certain way. Yeah. So mm-hmm. may, maybe a very clear and, and specific question: Could you tell us? Uh, about one of your projects, whatever projects you'd like to talk about, uh, and how you you were dealing with the finances for that project, or what? Uh, so, as, as a, almost like an example of of how you managed to pull off one one, one of your projects. Maybe Rihanna. Yeah. Oh no, maybe Hatan can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I, okay. Um, I think probably the one I'll talk about then is is probably that one that feels like the biggest learning curve, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, which was uh, a film I made in 2017 uh, called "Don't Look at the Finger," which um, was, um, I guess it's, I guess it's the kind of the first time that I've scaled my work up uh production budget wise and and that sort of thing and and previously you know i've just done it on the fly you know trying to just make my own budgets and speaking to people and just doing it very diy and this time um i was working with an organization in london called film and video umbrella who were sort of producing the the project and and so what they i had in my mind i'd worked out a budget for it of what i thought it would be and then, you know, then they uh, sort of helped me connect with a producer who, you know, talked through the project with me and what I wanted to do. And it turned out to be a lot, a lot more than what I'd anticipated, which was, which was a bit frightening. You know, I think I just to, just to, uh, I think I thought I could do it for £25,000. Um, and it ended up being between 60 and 70. Um, and so the t- what what ended up happening was um, the w- one the timeline changed because there's no way I could raise that kind of money um, in in the time in the initial timeline. So different partners had to be found, uh, or things had to be um, changed on the current partners timeline, etc. Um, and then that then that budget was largely made um between three of us myself film and video umbrella and the producer that I, that I was working with at that time for the first time um and i guess that's where um i learned a lot of things i guess that cost more money uh but ultimately ended up better for me or like um it helped me get a better result and you know by getting more people involved um and who who could you know do all these things that i i couldn't do to achieve the result that i wanted in terms of crew or artistic collaborators um and and then so that the the funding strategy for that was a combination of um film and video umbrella talking to certain galleries to try to get them on as partners who would put in a co-commissioning money as well as them. Me also speaking to gallery partners to, to try to do the same. And then us together putting in various different funding applications to Arts Council England, to some foundations, to some other people that they had uh, been to before. And then so bit by bit, we kind of you know got towards the budget that we needed to get whilst 
also whilst also of you know as tends to happen coming towards the crunch date of when it has to be ready for which at the at the, at the starting point seems like lots of time two two and a half years or whatever and then suddenly you're right near the end you still haven't got all the money um and you're trying to find ways to cut corners and without sort of um uh, sort of paying people less and and all of that sort of thing and then and I guess what did happen in that in that process which is still what happened when I was running budgets on my own was still that the higher you go up in that sort of you know the pecking order of the film the less you're paid you know mm-hmm. so you know if I worked at my day rate on that project I'll probably have to admit to myself that it was a hobby um, mm-hmm. you know it's it's, it's 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 where I ended up cutting the budget the most and I, I think we tend to do that as artists you know I'm not saying that's right uh, but you know as Rihanna says um, it's 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 part of the subsidy that you end up doing as an artist whether you end up uh, working other jobs for cash or um, end up you know cutting more and more of what you get paid on that project um, so so we you know we did get to that budget in the end but that but it took so much time. It took a lot more time uh, on the work than I, that I had anticipated, um, at, which meant obviously my day rate just kind of fell and fell and fell. And you know, as in one of the ways to cut corners was in certain areas of the design work or the choreography or whatever, where I, I would rather have got some help on, I ended up doing it on my own, or you know, it was just more strategic. You know, had to be more strategic. Um, about how I use my collaborators' time, um, or that sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit. It's not very clear what I just said. Then is it? I guess it's just. Uh, uh, I don't know what. I don't know that yeah, there's any message I mean, there or anything. What, but... I, what I definitely get out of it is, and I know that myself is like the tendency to self exploitation is always very high in the arts. Yeah. That at some point, like I, I know that for myself that. Uh, you have a certain amount of budget and you kind of like want to pay people for, for for helping you with the work and the first person you start cutting the budget is yourself because you'd rather pay someone else at least i do that all the time and then i end up with like uh like money that's as you say like uh is this my hobby or what is this <laughs> but yeah uh, rihanna yeah i thought that was a really good example i think because i think what it also points pointed out was this um like the importance of this uh of like oh, i don't want to say like, of somebody who can um is a conduit to all those other other people and the other funding so somebody who can be like an advocate on your behalf and i think sometimes there's there's very few of those people who work in like film programming or film commissioning um so I think once you once you find one of those people and they're they're backing you and they're giving you the seed funding, I think it it really helps grow. And I think the problem is there's just not enough, um, there's not enough of those people, right? Um, or like the vast majority of people can't even get access to those people because they're only dealing with people who've already got a level of visibility. Yeah. Um, so it's quite difficult to to think if you're like just starting out, how do you how do you get on their radar? Um, for me, I, I mean, I, I've got to admit, like, I don't, I don't really think I've worked um, over a budget of sort of twenty four thousand or twenty five thousand. I think that's pretty much, and that you know, that feels quite. I already appreciate that. That's also probably a lot more than what a lot of filmmakers um, in the UK have been able to access. And so, I'm just thinking of an example of working with a biennial here, actually, and and trying to remember the numbers of that, and that being of that amount, the fee was £2,000. Um, and that, and had tried to have a conversation about how fees are attributed to begin with. Um, and working out a day rate actually, um, had saying and saying, because part of that project did, um, did ask for some level of uh, work within the area in which the biennial was set, so there was a, an invitation to respond to a site. There was an invitation to respond to people within the neighborhood. And so there was kind of like, in addition to the film, there was all this other work that was going to happen around workshops and building relationships that would then become part of the work. Mm. And so if you're commissioned as a, as a sort of a person going and doing workshops, your day rate is this. 
But if you're going in to be filming, your derit is this. And if you're an editor, your derit is this. So I tried to do a budget that was quite realistic and said to them, this would take us to within five months of the project. And then after that, I'm working for free. Um, and it was interesting because I think there's also, you know, there's often a disparity between the, the visibility of certain projects and their appearance of having a level of funds and then actually what artists are left to, to sort of work with. And it's also not consistent. So some artists, are, there's no parity. Mm. Um, and that's also makes it very tricky. So it's really great to be having these conversations because I think the more that we speak about how often we are working for free, mm. um, the more that there's the possibility to unionize or um to actually you know ask what it what it means to be constantly offering your labor for free as artists but but i mean within that project as well i think um we did do this flat fee structure and it was this case like you're saying johannes about not wanting just because this is your project and you're committed to it you shouldn't expect that other people would self-exploit it for your work because i think there's also this other there's a second economy of an artwork right where once it's once you've got the fees to make it, it also circulates. And so there's the possibility of it generating an income afterwards because mm. the, the tape buys it or it exists somewhere else. So it's shown. And certainly with that work, it did get shown. And um, a few of the times it's not ever been, it's not ever sold, but, but similarly trying to build in mechanisms that um, can speak to the fact that there's a financial afterlife of a work. So, um, with that, with with all of the works that I've done that have a collaborative element, or um, there's always an agreement with the people that who who worked on it that um, not as crew, but like as um, authors or co-authors or co-producers, um, that the fees are split so that if we get uh, if the work sells, that they would we would get an equal share of the profit. Mm. Um, so yeah, just I think I'm yeah I'm just quite interested in thinking of different ways to intervene in those structures mm. that. Um, very often do exploit the artist, but also privilege the artist as well. Mm. Um, particularly when working in like social contexts. Um, and so for that, I, d I don't know if I've got anything particularly helpful to say in this context other than, yeah, the, the fee of the 25,000 was probably 2,000. Um, that, that also would have included um, the exhibition. So nothing to do with the actual production of the work, but it also included um, yeah, the workshops and the running of the workshops. And and at that time, I'd just had a baby as well. So wow. actually what was fortunate was that um, the commissioner did um, use the budget to pay for childcare so that I could come and do the project. So actually, luckily on site, there was a nursery. So we, it, it sort of, I mean, I think back, it's quite weird now, but I think there's also a gendered um, co a conversation to be had here and a racialized conversation. I think this is also why I'm interested in intervening because, you know, let's be honest, we don't see a huge amount of support for um, black and POC um, crew members and directors and women in those roles. So it's trying to think about actually, well, why, how are those inequalities performing, playing out and how does financing really um, absolutely reinforce that? Because mm. mm. quite often, you know, we, you know, many people can't afford to work for free. Um, mm. Not that not that some people can, but you know, there's definitely a decision there around um, economic disparity. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 um, I, I think uh, another binary you're talking about, Rihanna, and, and and all all of the ones that all of the when I feel like when you get invited to do things that have a um, a big profile with them or that sort of thing, where you tend to get. It, there's a there's a weird thing because um you know sometimes they will invite artists commission artists who are big name um wealthy artists who don't need that commissioning pot uh, and yet and so there's the, there isn't you know that i can't imagine that those any of these issues would ever you know come up but they but they but i feel i find that that same way of dealing with the artist is then applied to all the rest of us um, mm. who don't have those means to subsidize uh, all of that, all of that. And, and, and yet it's assumed that if you're 
invited to be part of those things or to show you those things that you that you that you either do have those means or you've just got to suck it up uh and kind of uh just do it and and, and i think that's um it's, it's it's really tricky and kind of speaks a little bit to um you know who in terms of financing who who is it for and who who gets access to it and you know it's like i often think also that um you know after so many years of making applications to the arts council i've i've, I've got i've got good at writing arts council applications you know but there's yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. it make, make, makes me feel a bit sick about that. And uh, you know, but and but the and that I find myself directing. You know, if I'm mentoring younger artists or whatever, I find myself directing them to places where they can read lots of successful arts council applications. And mm-hmm. you know, you, you you feel like you're teaching them a horrible drug, um, where <laughs> you say this will teach you how to write in a about your project in a way that will get you the money for it. Um, and you feel a bit funny about doing that, but... Uh... Well, yeah, because, I mean, the White Pew, the critics, the White Pew have a great, like, online resource of where mm. people have had successful applications, not just for um, public funding, but, like, for PhDs and, you know, different ways in which artists are trying to survive. But there is, the, I think that's a totally um, legitimate question, and it's something I think about a lot, but if we're all writing applications in the same way, how does that then feed back in this very quiet way into the kind of work that we're producing because I, I think you can't entirely safeguard your work from the process of writing it within the terms of an, a funding application or oh, maybe you can maybe I'm just being paranoid but um mm. but then at the same time how will those structures ever change if you're if everyone's just totally compliant and performing to them so surely mm. if a, um, an application appears that is completely out of the box like so strange but then it also enable like it also kind of forces the the funder to mm-hmm. acknowledge how um yeah like how inaccessible of those forms often are or those processes often are i mean the whole process of pitching i think like for a lot of people that is like an absolute nightmare and yeah. and requires a certain idea of like um forms of presentation, self-presentation, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it really relies on a particular personality type or yeah. a lot of... Um... And it's also like the way, I guess, how neoliberalism kind of like creeps yeah. into the art world because mm-hmm. the, the better you can present yourself, the better the better you're at performing your your role in the system, the, the higher chances are for getting funds. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been trying to kind of like cross finance my, my projects because I kind of realized some of that stuff will never ever get public money. Uh, so for most of the projects that I do don't get a lot of like art, art funding, but I realized that uh, for me personally, I was very good at speaking about those projects. So I tried to get gigs at, at universities or art institutions of, of talking, pretty much like talking gigs. And my talking gigs kind of like co-finance my art world uh, pieces because I can then just like take half of the speaking fee I make and put it into a project uh, because I wouldn't be able to get funding for that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to be creative about that. Uh, have you ever like done something like that? Like trying to kind of get money from somewhere else for something that, that you really wanted to do? I mean, it's, I find that difficult to say because I feel like it's only over the last couple of years that I've started to understand my own relationship to money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I've, I think I've just recently in the last year, for example, changed the way that I, my... Um, banking works to you know open a limited company mm-hmm. and and all that sort of stuff that lots of my peers have been doing forever and I just didn't I was just too scared to do it and and even that's kind of blown my mind a bit to be honest because before then I still kind of have been operating as a like I did when I graduated to be honest you know it's just to have a bank account and stuff comes in and stuff goes out and you, you know um you're trying oh, to think I feel like you're reading me now Hattay. all right <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> it's, 
I'm not, yeah, I'm still, I'm still in, I'm still doing it. I've, no, I've got a separate bank account, but it's definitely not a limited. It's not but, I, but I did that as well. I had a separate bank account because I thought I'll put Arts Council fund into that. But then yeah. how I tried to do my, write the accounts after just look, became so complicated. And, wow. you know, it's sort of like, try, then you, you're into the situation. Do I, do I pay my mortgage this month or do I, you know, pay for a, a week's studio to do some rehearsals? can i bank on another job coming in to pay this sort of thing and and that's really stressful way of um li living um and um and so i've only recently started to um to change that um probably through lockdown when i when i had a bit of time at the beginning so <laughs> right i need to sort this out um and so i've started to sort that out and feel feeling much well starting to feel much better for it sort of thing and uh but it's 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 a long process, and and I feel like this sounds a bit randomly saying this, but I feel like it it sh feeds into how I should then think about what you just asked uh, Johannes about funding. Do looking for it elsewhere, or do you attribute it to a project, or you know, um, yeah, I think I think it all it's all kind of linked, isn't it, to our relationship to money and yeah, self worth, yeah. and it's uh, all about like creative accounting in a certain way. <laughs> I mean, it definitely. I, I'm, I definitely do because I feel like all, all of my work is kind of entangled anyway like I feel like there's a like I'm, I feel like I'm working with a body of research that has these moments of crystallization or there's a kind of an opportunity to articulate something in this space here but it it, it reads in relation to the other films or in relation to future things so a bit similar to what you were saying Hattain in terms of like having a sort of a longer view and then having these shorter term views as well of work. Mm. And so then I do try and cross, I do try and make the money work across different projects. So mm, yeah, right. So then if I get a bit of funding here, I, because I really like shooting myself actually, and I really like editing myself, I really mm. find that that's a lot of, um, yeah, like that's the most enjoyable space for me when also I'm not looking at admin and emails. Um, so I, in a way I try and each bit of funding, I might try and get a new bit of kit or, um, actually what I've just done is I've just shot something and it's going to form part of another film that I'm working on next year, but I'm thinking of making a short from it now and working with it in a different way. And so I'm trying to even make the footage work across these projects because often mm. I, the footage might appear differently anyway. Um, so I'm just, I guess I am trying to think about how I can be creative about how I can make things work across different funding strands and not only in terms of equipment, but material or shooting something here now in this way, but that it might, um, for one project, but it might actually lead into or form the basis of other work at a later stage. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I feel like that was a really incoherent response, but in my head, it sort of makes sense of like trying to, trying to stretch and reuse and repurpose. Um, I think there's also, I mean, I know in a really basic way as an answer to your question, um, well, yeah, I teach, so that's how I pay my bills yeah. because okay. yeah. money is like, really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So money is not consistent enough for me to, um, cause it, you know, it lands in these chunks and then you very quickly sort of distribute it. Um, so having, having the base of a regular income every month is, is just, has been really important for me in terms of knowing like yeah my bills are paid and and then I know that a lot of people use additions as a way of generating a little bit of extra income just to kickstart projects as well which um I, yeah has I mean I think that's really been a, um, a symptom of the pandemic as well um I certainly what is what I've observed like of the last like 18 months noticing a lot more friends like using online channels to share and disseminate work and that then going back into funding for projects or just living actually just to live off as well because so much freelance work dried up um so now we all own each other's work which is quite nice yeah uh, but also I mean, that really, yeah i believe in that as well that like uh, i work with the i really feel like I've built up a shorthand with the people that I work with. So I kind of really want to work with them again. And I don't know, share like my, I, I would happily work with friends as their DOP or whatever, or recordist or editor. 
um, or just like talk with them about their work and likewise. So there's trying to build up a, I think this is definitely like a post art school, post um, film school sort of the chat of like, you know, have your network and rely on each other and build up like mm -hmm. these other forms of exchange that don't always mean that you're having to employ people. But I think there's something quite long standing in that as well, actually. Yeah. In terms of, um, yeah, knowing like some fun, really great sound recordists or uh, DOPs or color graders who I know that like I can just completely trust now and will elevate this thing to like, or we'll share, have a, we have a shared language. So um, that also kind of compresses the amount of time something would take because, you know, it's in safe hands. It's, it feels more, it feels human as well, doesn't it? The, the kind of this, this labor exchange uh that we kind of initially initially sort of get into because we've got no cause not got the money <laughs> but it's like it, the it, trade, you know yeah but there's something yeah. really nice about it it's like it's not you know once you get into it it's you don't you no longer do it because you have to just because you have to but it's it's a nice it's really nice to do that it's kind of you get to connect with people and uh as, as you say rihanna get a shorthand with people and uh, both about your work and their work and you know it's, I think that's a, it's a good way to operate. I suppose it's also like try uh, and I definitely don't mean like everything has to be transactional and there's a danger of like turning all your friendships into transactional mm. <laughs> and I actually just want to be mates with people uh, yes. and not feel like you constantly in debt to each other but yeah. I, I think there's always something really nice when you see on a list of credits you see in mm. a name pop up of somebody like you know in like of old, you know, filmmakers from the eighties or whatever, or it's certainly in London where there was a big cooperative movement um, of like mm. filmmaking cooperatives and video cooperatives, and you see the same names pop up in different in different spaces as different roles across these films, and so it mm. actually does also challenge this idea of like the director as the as the auteur or as the mm. as the single minded like visionary, because actually you realise that oh, actually no, um, you know. Uh, I don't know, Judah Atiel was filming uh, on this film with that person, with Isaac Julian. So actually the beauty in that shot maybe is is also coming from them. And mm. you know that there's, so it's, it's again, it's trying to uh, intervene in these like structures that that are really neoliberal, right? And that really yeah, yeah. pits us against each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting to see that. Uh, the, I don't know if it's just me, but your voice is really looping. Is it? Is it just me? I can't. Hear that. It's fine. Ah, right. Sorry, it must be something on my end. No, it's gone. No, it's gone. <laughs> All right. No, Sorry. but what I was, uh, what I was witnessing, like over the last kind of like ten years or something like that, is that specifically, and and Rihanna, you 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 mentioned it, like kickstarting and, and crowdfunding. Uh, platforms kind of like appeared and especially of course in the US many artists used crowdfunding because there is no public funding system so where should we get money for our indie projects so people started kickstarters and and, and used crowdfunding to 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 get uh, to get money for their projects uh, and now you mentioned that during the pandemic that also happened in the UK so it's always it's kind of interesting to see that as like almost like a petri dish of like Oh no! Uh, what 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 happens if there's if the money dries up? So what what other ways of getting your hands on money are there? And it's it's interesting that kickstarting is like one of those things, and it's almost like a blessing and a curse at the same time because I kind of like it that it's there and that I could use it, but at the same time, it's also this like strangely uh, like institutionalized system of, of of begging for money <laughs> i don't know uh and like how, how is your how is your relationship with with kickstarting and, and crowdfunding me or yeah. i've never done it mm -hmm. <laughs> <Neither have> i <laughs> <laughs> i mean, I mean that, that's a good I, point yeah. i mean uh so so did you don't use it because you kind of like feel it it's it's nothing that would work for me uh, or, or my projects, or is it just like that? That you did just like it wasn't necessary. Let's, let's call it that way. It it just for me the reason I never got into it. It just seemed like a hell of a lot of work mm -hmm. um, to um, for little gain, um, or like 
you know, or maybe that's because at the time I was probably working in dance a lot more and the, the money's even smaller in, in dance. And so like, you know, you, uh, you know, friends of mine are just doing the whole online performance and you know you mentioned the begging we're all we're always all begging for money aren't we but on on those platforms and you know there's virtually no money coming in um and and what was was generally from people's own family and relatives who kind of chucked a bit in sort of thing and it just seemed like i just it just didn't seem like a good use of time but you know that that's that's saying that from having not personally tried it so you should yeah. yeah. I don't I I'm I sort of had like I feel really ambivalent towards it. Like um I've I've supported a lot of um social causes through like crowdfunding and uh Kickstarters and things, but I, I do feel it's not really something that I personally would want to do for my work because I, I kind of I think there is that thing about it it being people's family and friends ultimately that end up funding your artwork and I don't know I think it asks questions of like what public funding is really and like where where are those public funds being um attributed to and like why why is it that I guess I'm I'm slightly suspicious of it or skeptical that the more I don't know we have this big thing here in the UK under the conservative government called you know the big society and this push for volunteerism as a way of substituting like the pulling out of like um, public funds into things like the welfare state or, or a lot and a lot of arts funding as well and I, I kind of my concern is that the more um, common that like kickstarts and crowdfunding and um, these types of funds become they the more they um what allow these public funds to dissipate or to disappear and that actually the challenge should be you know we, the pressure should be on making sure that we retain those funds mm -hmm. and that we you know the value that we see value in arts and culture um it's not seen as something that can be like cut but but i but i also like appreciate like i i I don't have like I, I'm saying this, um, I'm voicing this concern, but I also, you know, I fully appreciate like there's some projects that I think I definitely would fund if it was, you know, sort of an independent like self-organized like group of artists who wanted to put out a book or something or like so, I don't know something that wouldn't necessarily would be very difficult to because to access public funds then you know maybe the it's too experimental or it's, it doesn't quite fit. And, you know, you talk about dance and ten and how difficult it is to get funding for that. So I, d I do acknowledge that there are, maybe it does serve a purpose at the moment and that there are, there are possibilities within it, but I just, I just don't know really. I just have a, I just have a feeling about it that I wouldn't, I don't quite feel like I want to use it for my work just yet. I'd try and find other means before going to that, I think. Mm, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. What, what uh, Hitain said, the whole like, yeah, modern dance or something like that. There's not really a big market for that kind of stuff, or like you know, like experimental lyrics or something like that, or poetry. Like, like who funds like an experimental poetry book uh, on Kickstarter? I mean, there are certain things that work and certain things, who do, and and we kind of see it. I mean, if people do independent video games or something like that, there is a higher chance of getting that project done because also the. The people who pay for that uh, kind of like get early access to the game or something like that. So there are certain like dynamics for it, like in certain artistic formats that that are kind of like perfect for kickstarting, but certain things are just like not working. So it's kind of. But again, I guess we have the neoliberal dilemma that just like certain things are just like presenting themselves better in the marketplace than others, and then then we run into the problem that. Uh, yeah, some stuff just like falls under the table and nobody cares for it. So yeah, but I, I, I completely agree, like as a good old leftist, I completely agree that we have to fight <laughs> the good fight for for uh, arts funding. I mean, there's... Yeah, there's okay. no, yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry, I totally interrupted. Absolutely. No. But no, no, I mean, it seems to go, like you said, I think maybe, I don't know if this is what you're alluding to, Tane, in terms of the work that's involved. I mean, it's like a hell of a lot of marketing. And if you're good at marketing, then your crowdfunder gets 
visibility in backers and so so yeah maybe it's that kind of like like you say like the what gets noticed and what gets funded and what gets like falls off the table and and doesn't it, it it's a bit brutal and it's yeah. Like, yeah the economy is a bit compromised in a way but um or or sort of yeah I don't know, maybe it relies, if you have an existing community that is already interested, invested in it, like a gaming community that can that can support it, then that's where it works. But if you're relying on trying to generate or create a community, that's where it becomes quite, um, yeah, like it, referring back to anyway, these models that are kind of a little bit um, compromised somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are already at the end uh, of, of our little conversation. It's, it, it's an hour, uh, uh, flew by like nothing. Uh, so it was really great uh, get, getting your stories and your, your perspective. Uh, is there something that you want to add? Maybe something like, maybe even like your website or something like that, where people can check out what you're currently working on or something like that. So maybe, maybe, maybe we can help you get a little bit like a money stream towards you. I don't know. By, by, by send by cash the here. Send yeah, cash here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Press this your, button. Your, your Patreon account or whatever. So, uh, yeah. No, I just uh, maybe I'll just signal. Um, so, so my work is distributed by Lux. So, if you want to see any of my work, you can see it at lux.org.uk, which is an artist movement image distributor. Um, and yeah, I also work with a, on the board of, um, an artist worker cooperative, um, who do a lot of work with film, um, like traditional film sort of processes and run lots of workshops called Not Nowhere. So I would encourage you to go and support the artist workers cooperative, um, if you want, and you get lots of like access to resources by being interested in them. That's... <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Into it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I'll, I've always. Uh, yeah, I think you should do what Rihanna just said. Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, if you want to see any of my work, uh, you can see my website, hitainpatel.com. Just the same spelling that's on my name on the screen thing yeah. there. Yeah. Sadly, you can't put money into it by pressing it. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, what can I say? I have my very personal working man in the back there. And he reminds me <laughs> of the general struggle every day. <laughs> so I have it right there. Uh, it was such a pleasure uh, talking to you. Thank you for being part of the V3 via Enel. And uh, all, all the best to, to London and have a great evening. Yeah, thank you so much, Johannes. Thanks so much, Johannes, for having us. <laughs> Everyone behind the scenes as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Take care. Bye. Bye.